Um, as everyone should know, uh, we're doing a, this is kind of a kickoff event for our Lenten book study, which is uh, this year it's GPH Chesterton's Orthodoxy. It started today actually. Um, it's between services, and um, Gannon is uh, Gannon is teaching it, directing it. Are there, is it possible to join late? Oh yeah. Is there, yeah. Is there some sort of penalty for people who weren't there today? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Very well. Um, so on that note, uh, today we're very pleased to welcome a special guest speaker. It's Mr. Dale Alquist. Mr. Alquist is the president of the American Chesterton Society and one of the world's uh, foremost authorities on G.K. Chesterton. So it's a real treat for us to have him with us today. Mr. Alquist. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. I know you've been sitting here for one week waiting for me to arrive. It was very Chestertonian of me to arrive one week late for the talk I was supposed to give. His absent-mindedness was legendary, and I had no idea that uh, in my, you know, in my reading of him, that I would become that much like him. <laughs> I will tell you a little bit about. Um, my own story with Chesterton, I'll give you a little introduction to Chesterton, I'll talk about orthodoxy a little bit, and then I'll, I'll be happy to take any questions at all about anything, okay? And then we'll, we'll still be here on the end of the day. Um, so, uh, and let me start by asking you a question. I'll, I'll start with the first question. What is the one kind of literature that is most successful when it makes you feel stupid. What kind of literature is it that is, is most satisfying when it, when it makes you feel stupid? <laughs> We're all bashful. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Philosophy? Philosophy. The, the love of wisdom. You think saying that wisdom literature that is supposed to make you feel wise actually makes no. <laughs> <laughs> Philosophy is most satisfying when it makes you feel wise, when it actually does what it's supposed to do. That is the purpose of philosophy, is to make you feel wise. So yeah, that's not the answer. Right now it's a speech that's doing it today. <laughs> <laughs> and you're, you're feeling good right now. Feeling pretty I'm feeling good. good. Yeah, feeling good. <laughs> One more guess. Mystery. Mystery. Who said it? Uh, I didn't. Lynn did. Lynn, Lynn, said, it and she's Lynn said it to you and it came out of your mouth. Yes. Okay, well, you know what? That is the right answer. A good detective story, if it's well done, well crafted, when you get to the end, when you get to the solution, you're supposed to do. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Of course it was the brother-in-law who was the veterinarian who was poisoning the dog food. <laughs> oh, why didn't I? Of course I saw it. I saw it coming. It was right there. The clue was under your nose the whole time, and yet you did not see it. You were looking at it, and you did not see it. And the writer, if he is a master at his genre, reveals to you what you already know. And that is why G.K. Chesterton is a master of detective fiction, but it's also why he's a master of all the writing that he does, because everything he writes, it, he, he achieves that effect of revealing to you things that you already know, but he makes you see them for the first time. He says, you can, you can look at a thing 999 times and then see it for the first time when you look at it for the thousandth time. And, and his essays have really the same effect as a good mystery story. That when you get to the last line, it's just some triumphal, uh, wonderful revelation that you didn't see coming. And it just makes it for immensely satisfying reading. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, G.K. Chesterton is the master of the one-liner. He has these great quotations. These, these little compact truths, concentrated truths, uh, truth pills, <laughs> where uh, 
you know, it's a, some self-evident truth uh, that, that when you hear it, it's so well worded. You, you've heard some of the things like, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting, it's been found difficult and left untried. Or truth, of course, must be stranger than fiction because we have made fiction to suit ourselves. And men will not argue about what they call evils. They'll argue about which evils they call excusable. And uh, being educated means being able to read the newspaper. Being properly educated means not believing the newspaper after you've read it. <laughs> <laughs> And, and the Bible tells us to love our neighbor and to love our enemies, generally because they're the same person. <laughs> <laughs> and angels fly because they take themselves lightly. <laughs> A great line from Orthodoxy. You'll get to it in about the seventh or eighth chapter. Uh, Chesterton <clears throat> was actually one of the most prolific writers who ever lived. He, uh, he wrote for 36 years. He started, started getting published in 1900. He died in 1936 and virtually was writing the entire time, nearly up to the day he died. Uh, he uh, wrote 100 books. He wrote introductions to 200 more books. He wrote hundreds and hundreds of poems. He wrote some very famous detective stories featuring a character named Father Brown, who was a priest, but he wrote some other detective stories as well. He wrote uh, seven novels, he wrote uh, four or five plays. Uh, his books cover all different subjects from history to philosophy to theology to uh, social criticism and, and uh, economics and literary criticism, <coughs> art criticism, and, uh, and his, uh, his private, but his books really are only a fraction of what he wrote. He was primarily a journalist, and he wrote literary essays for major uh, newspapers and periodicals on both sides of the Atlantic. And he wrote at least 5,000 essays. So I want you to just think about that number for a little bit. In fact, what I want you to do is go home today and write an essay. Just, just go, because that's probably what you were going to do anyway. <laughs> uh, and then tomorrow, write another essay. And then you will have written two essays, okay? So then you, you're getting the hang of it now. If you write an essay every day for the next 15 years without taking Sundays off, you'll get pretty close to that number of 5,000. And then when you're done, then you can start writing your novels and that book on St. Thomas Aquinas that you've always wanted to write. Uh, Chesterton could actually write two essays at one time. He could write one out longhand and dictate an entirely different essay to his secretary at the same time. So you see, that would cut your writing time in half. <laughs> Pretty soon you could work just one day a week like a priest. <laughs> but because he was always writing, always, always under a deadline to everything he wrote, even his poetry was written under deadlines. Uh, he was just always writing and always concentrating. Didn't have, didn't really have any time or energy or desire to pay attention to those little things in life that really consume our, our whole attention. He let his wife take care of those things, and she did. She, he was utterly dependent on his wife, Frances, who made sure he got up, got dressed, got fed, got to the desk, got to his next appointment. He was in constant demand as a speaker, and she usually always accompanied him uh, wherever, he, wherever he had to give a talk. Once in a while, for one reason or another, she was not able to be with him, and then disaster would ensue immediately. And there's the great story of him getting off a train in the days before cell phones, walking to a telegraph station, and send, sending a telegram to his wife. M at Market Harborough, where ought I to be? <laughs> <laughs> if his wife 
wife didn't know that he was supposed to speak at St. Dunstan's, he'd turn up a week late. <laughs> he, uh, he once hailed a cab to take him to an address that was across the street. <laughs> once hailed a cab to take him to the offices of G. Case Weekly, the newspaper that he was the editor of. <laughs> didn't know the address. The cab driver had to stop at a newspaper stand and buy a copy of the paper to get him to his own office. And then, of course, getting out of the cab was the great adventure because Chesterton was 300 pounds, six foot four, just a giant. And the cab driver, the story of him struggling to get Chesterton out of the cab, said, Perhaps if you get out sideways, Mr. Chesterton, he said, I have no sideways. <laughs> said it's impossible to be fat in secret. <laughs> he said, I'm sure that the thin monks were holy, but I know that the fat monks were humble. <laughs> and he considered himself the politest man in all of England because he could stand up on a bus and offer his seat to three women at one time. <laughs> he also said he was the, the, the jolliest man in all of England because there was such a lot of me having a good time at once. <laughs> and yet this, this overgrown elf who used to amuse children at birthday parties by catching buns in his mouth was someone who wrote an essay in the Illustrated London News that inspired Gandhi to begin leading a movement for the independence of India. And he wrote a novel that inspired Michael Collins to start a war with England for Irish independence. And he wrote a book called The Everlasting Man that was read by a young atheist named C.S. Lewis, who found that his life had totally changed by the time he finished reading it. He said it was the first reasonable explanation of Christianity that he'd ever read. He said in his memoir, uh, Surprised by Joy, that a young man who's serious about his atheism cannot be too careful about what he reads. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, a lot of people have asked the question, somebody already asked me right before the, uh, we met here, uh, were Chesterton and C.S. Lewis uh, contemporaries? And their lives did overlap, but they never met each other. Uh, Lewis, of course, was familiar with Chesterton's writings. But, uh, but Lewis's own literary career was just beginning right at the time when Chesterton died. So Chesterton never read anything by C.S. Lewis and, and really didn't know who he was. I had the great privilege of meeting uh, Walter Hooper, uh, C.S. Lewis's secretary, uh, last year in Oxford. And, and, and he told me that, that Lewis's one great regret was that he never met C.S. Lewis. He wanted, to, or that met Chesterton. He, he wanted to, but he, as a young man, he was just too shy to approach him. And uh, he had this great plan that um, uh, he and a couple other guys were going to write a volume of poetry and ask Chesterton to write the introduction to it. Because this is one of the things that Chesterton would do, is he would write introductions to, to volumes of poetry by young poets. And that way they could get their book published. Because a, uh, a publisher would happily publish anything with an introduction by, by G.K. Chesterton. So this was, he helped launch some careers that way. And, uh, and the, the, the two things that didn't happen was that C.S. Lewis uh, and his friends never actually wrote the volume of poetry <laughs> and then never asked Chesterton to write the so, um, And so he was, uh, you know, immensely uh, <coughs> prolific, as I mentioned, and influential too, and popular. I mean, he was really one of the best known writers in the world, and uh, his... Um, his fame was, was really worldwide. His, he's been translated into just every imaginable language. You, you, it's, it's astounding to see the, the breadth of the translations of Chesterton. There's a, there's a thousand translations of Chesterton. Just it's incredible. Um, and, uh, and he came on two lecture tours to America. In fact, he actually came through Minneapolis in 1921. And wherever he came, it was it was really headline news. It was front page news in every city that he visited. 
uh, in the United States. He was that popular. And he died in 36, and he, in just very short time, within a generation, just went into a total eclipse. Uh, and there's really, there's really two, three, three good reasons why, they're not good, but they're the <laughs> explanations of, of, of why he, he disappeared uh, and, and why he uh, just lost his popularity. One, I mean, certainly World War II was this brokenness in the, in the century. Everything was different. Uh, it, was, it was the the great schism of the uh, of the century, the great abyss. And and I think in the wake of World War II, nobody was prepared to to read Chesterton's great joy, his 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 lovely sense of wonder <coughs> and, and thankfulness for the gift of existence, and, and and you know his childlike goodness. They 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 didn't want innocence. They wanted despair. You have the rise of existentialism after that, and people really comforting themselves with despair, with meaninglessness, and, and the literature took on a new meaninglessness. Uh, and then, of course, uh, even though Chesterton would have been taught and was taught in really all of our major universities and, and minor universities, they stopped teaching. Uh, they stopped teaching Chesterton for for the, the the fact that he doesn't really fit into any category. He doesn't really fit into any department. Uh, he's, you know, his, his literature is beautiful, he's a giant of, of English letters, and yet his literature is too religious for the, for the English department. Uh, he could be taught in the philosophy department, but he's too literary for the philosophy department. And, uh, and he's, he's, he makes the, the theology departments too uncomfortable as well. And so you have the great irony of the 300 pound writer who's fallen through the cracks. Because <laughs> there's simply no place to put him. He's too big for any of our categories. Uh, and, uh, and so there's that. And the fact that he, he always does have an eternal perspective. Whatever he writes about, he wrote for the secular press, and yet he wrote about Christianity. He always pointed to God. Uh, and, and there was always an ultimate meaning that he was invoking. And he did it with great success, but you know the modern world doesn't doesn't want that kind of writing, especially the secular world. And so he was rejected because of that. But the but the main reason why people stopped reading him after he died is that he stopped writing after he died. <laughs> <laughs> um, he 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 was popular, as I said, but he was popular because people read him in the newspapers. His books, you know, have. It survived, but I mean, all, all most all of his books went out of print for you know, for, for 20, 30 years. Um, you know, Orthodoxy and, and Everlasting Man, the Father Brown stories have always been in print, but uh, but the rest of them all went out of print, and uh, it wasn't until the recent revival of interest that these books have rushed into print, back into print again. But the reason why people knew it was not through his books, but because of his. He would appear in the newspapers, and even if he didn't write specifically for that newspaper, that newspaper would have an article about something that Chesterton did or said. So everyone is always familiar with with what Chesterton's perspective was on everything during his lifetime. That stopped. The other thing about Chesterton that's very important is that even though he's hard to categorize as a writer, there's one category that he fits that fits him very nicely. He was a prophet. He seemed to be writing more for our time now than even for the time that he lived. He seemed to be seeing what we're seeing now before anyone else saw it. Uh, in 1902, he said, we are learning to do a great many clever things. The next thing we're going to have to learn is not to do them. <laughs> he predicted that there'd be a revolution in Russia. and. Uh, when uh, when Chester when when uh, when Russia fell to uh, the communists, he was as you know distressed as anyone that that, Czech, that Russia would fall for the philosophy of Marx. But he did say that Marxism would die out in in Russia because it simply could not be sustained. It would be it would be gone in a couple of generations. He said. Um, but he said, what's even worse. Then Russia falling for the philosophy of, of Marx was America 
falling for the philosophy of Freud. And he said that uh, the next great heresy is going to simply be an attack on morality, especially on sexual morality. And the madness of tomorrow is not in Moscow, but much more in Manhattan. And uh, he predicted that uh, there would be a great upheaval in, in our society with the breakup of the family. And he, he really warned about the easy acceptance of divorce. Uh, he says the obvious effect of frivolous divorce will be frivolous marriage. Uh, when he came to America, it found that uh, Americans could be divorced for incompatibility. He said, well, then they should all be divorced. Because <laughs> 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 men and women as such are incompatible. And the whole point of marriage is to work through the incompatibility. Marriage is a duel to the death. <laughs> He also, uh, he also saw a danger in the rise um, of an emphasis on animal rights. He says, wherever you have animal worship, you will have human sacrifice. Oh. And he says, the, 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 the worship of nature will always lead to something unnatural. He says, nature is not our mother. Nature is our sister because we both have the same father. And our attitude towards nature should be the attitude towards our sister, which is respect and playfulness, but she has no authority over us. <laughs> and uh, in fact, that's from orthodoxy, too. You will like this book. I'm telling you. <laughs> he also, uh, also worried about what would happen if the government took over education. <laughs> he said, we've given more power to the government than we have at any time in all of human history when we put the government in charge of education, educating our children. Because education is simply truth passing from one generation to the next. That's all education is. It's passing the truth from one generation to the next. <coughs> He says, the modern world has fallen for this, uh, uh, just a, a collapse in intellect over the word education. Because they don't talk about what is actually being taught. They're only talking about education as if it's a, something. When it's really passing to, and if we put the government in charge of passing the truth from one generation to the other, he says, the argument is always going to be about what is truth. And if the state is saying, well, we have to leave religion out of it, then you can't pass the truth. I mean, what you're passing on is not going to be the truth. You're going to have some disconnected facts and fragments of the truth, maybe. But you're going to be teaching fragments. And the result is that our children will be thinking in fragments. And if you listen to them talk, they, they talk in fragments, too. So, uh, he says, every high civilization decays by forgetting obvious things. And we have this obsession with the newest and the latest and the greatest. He says, we've found ways to, to get to the North Pole, he said in 1930. We'll find probably a way to get to the moon. But the only question that we haven't answered is why we would want to go there. He said, we've come up with the best forms of communication in all of history precisely at the moment when we have nothing to say. <laughs> he says, this is the way the whole world is going. You'll soon find your own city so sick with chemical vapors that air will have to be pumped into them from the country outside. In the modern world, since 1925, is a crowd of very rapid racing cars all brought to a standstill and stuck in a block of traffic. <laughs> in 1932, he said that the world was headed towards a new war 
it would be the worst war in all of human history, and it would begin on the Polish border. Now, the problem with listing Chesterton's prophecies is, it, is that prophets tend to sound gloomy. They just have that quality. But the thing about a prophet is this. A prophet wants to be wrong. A prophet has no desire to see his prophecy fulfilled. What he's doing is he's warning us that this is the road you're on and this is how it's going to end. But what you need to do is turn around. You need to repent. Read the Old Testament prophets. They're all talking about repentance and turning back. But if you don't, this is how it's going to end. But really, the message of every prophet is the message of Isaiah. Seek the Lord while he may be found, and call upon him while he is near, and let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy and abundantly pardon. And so, the thing about a prophet is that he wants to be wrong. Chesterton really is, is preaching repentance. What he's preaching, of course, is joy. But just the, the great secret of the Christian, which is joy. Uh, and Chesterton has this sense of wonder and gratitude that's really unmatched by any other modern writer. When he says that the least grain of dust has never been praised enough. He says, existence is a strange thing to me. And as a stranger, I give it welcome. The world will never starve for want of wonders, but only for want of wonder. And there are no dull sights, only dull sightseers. <laughs> he said, we should always endeavor to wonder at the permanent thing, not at the mere exception. We should be startled by the sun, not by the eclipse. And we should wonder less at the earthquake and wonder more at the earth. The supreme adventure is being born. We have this gift of existence, this gift that we could not have possibly earned. And there's only one correct reaction to that, and that's thankfulness. And if thankfulness informs all of our thinking, really nothing can touch us. We cannot even get angry because we have to regard everything as a gift. Exactly what the Apostle Paul says is to be thankful in all things. And that is something that Chesterton actually achieved and really was what informed him as a writer and why he, uh, he really had a great effect on everyone around him. Everyone who knew him said it was a beatitude to know him because his joy, his goodness, that's what they were attracted to. Um, I want to just talk briefly about the book Orthodoxy, which you're going to start reading. And any, any of you who haven't joined the group, you should. It's truly one of the great books. It's a book you can return to again and again. I teach the book every year. I have the great privilege of rereading it every year. I never get tired of it. It's really a bottomless well. The first time you read Orthodoxy, you will underline the entire book. <laughs> and then when you get to the end, you'll wonder what the heck you just read. <laughs> so you, then you'll read it again. And then you have this very, very bizarre experience of reading a book that you've obviously read before because you can see your own underlinings in it. And yet Chesterton has rewritten the book since the last time you read it. <laughs> He's one of the only authors that can do it, who can rewrite all of his books between the times that you've read them. And rewrite the very copy that you're reading. So then the third time you read it, it starts to bear fruit. It's, the arguments start coming together. There's one essential idea you have to know going into reading orthodoxy. And that is the concept of paradox. Chesterton is the master of paradox, but what is paradox? Literally, the Greek word means against the received truth or the received opinion. In other words, something that seems contradictory, something that goes against our expectation. 
the corollary is when you have two truths that are both true, but they seem to contradict each other. Um, there's another book that you could read that is full of paradox. It has things in it like the first shall be last and the last shall be first. <laughs> And if you save your life, you'll lose it. And if you lay down your life for my sake, you'll gain it. And uh, a virgin shall give birth, and the dead shall rise. And blessed are the poor, and blessed are those who mourn. And count it all joy when you meet various trials. Those are all paradoxes. I can't think of the name of the book right now. <laughs> Those are all truths that go against our expectation. And Chesterton is the master of the paradox when he says things like the self is more distant than any star. And the worship of health becomes unhealthy. <laughs> and uh, um, sometimes a thing can be too big to be seen. And so he uses paradox because that really is the nature of how we understand truth. There is this contradiction that seems at the center of truth, that if we accept that, that seeming contradiction, everything else makes sense. The ultimate paradox is Jesus Christ, who is fully God and fully man at the same time. Not something half one, half the other, and not something different from either God or man, but truly God and truly man at the same time, in the same person. It's a concept that we can't really grasp, but once we accept, everything else makes sense. The cross has as, at its center a contradiction. It's, uh, it's eternity contradicting time, and it's, it's life contradicting death. And Chesterton uses the symbol of the cross very well in orthodoxy to explain uh, why the symbol makes sense to explain the faith and how it differs from any other philosophy. So he starts the book by explaining um, that, that he's written this book in response to a challenge uh, which, which came after he wrote the book Heretics. And, uh, that, that one of the critics of heretics said, well, we'll worry about our philosophy when Mr. Chesterton tells us his. He said, well, I'm only too glad to do so. And here, here it is. And he explained how he came upon this philosophy, which happens to be Christianity as articulated in the Apostles' Creed, uh, that he said he, he'd set off to found his own heresy. And when he put the finishing touches on, found that it was orthodoxy. The, the perfect religion that he had, had intended to come up with was something that someone else had come up with about 1900 years before he did. He said, it's like the man who goes off to discover a foreign country and his boat gets turned around and he comes back to his own country. He lands on the shores of his own nation thinking he's somewhere else and plants the flag for his own country and looks around at all these familiar things as if he's seen them for the first time. And that's what he ended up doing, was looking at Christianity as a complete, fresh, and new idea that, that he had never seen before, because he came at it as an outsider. And, turned, and, and, and that's the way he wants us always to look at the world, as if we're looking at it for the first time. He said he came to believe in Christianity not because of any of the great defenses of it, but because of all the attacks on it. It was the, it was the critics of Christianity who convinced him that it was true. Because they attacked from all sides, and all of their attacks were contradictory. So what is it about this thing that people don't mind contradicting themselves, falling over each other in order to attack? He's, in the book, in the chapter of the Maniac, he'll talk about how the modern philosophies all lead to madness. If you take any of the modern philosophies to their logical and fullest extent, they will bring you into Hanwell. And you know, you have to know what Hanwell is. Hanwell is an insane asylum, okay? <laughs> That's the little uh, glossary key you need. Uh, and 
and then the, the, the next chapter is that not only are the modern ideas uh, uh, insane, they're also self-destructive. And then it's then with the ethics of Belfland, the, the fourth chapter, everything he starts putting together everything from the ground up, and, and talks about how he learned all the basic great truths in the nursery through fairy tales, and how this was the simple way that generations would pass great truths from, from one generation to the next in, in the fairy tales. And so then he just starts slowly building relentlessly, uh, just what is a masterpiece of rhetoric, he just relentlessly builds this case for Christianity. And, and uh, there's a lot of great one-liners, but if you look for the paradoxes, which you'll find on every page, you'll get through the book nicely. Okay, that's me. Now tell me, what, what would you like me to, uh, to address here? What are your questions? <laughs> What's that? I can hardly wait to Oh, good. That's good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I, um, here's a little, uh, a little trick of mine. If you, if you go to our website at chesterton.org, and if you sign up for our regular newsletter, and then send an email through the website saying, I want the study guide to orthodoxy. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Maybe I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, can, can you tell us anything about, about his roots? Yeah, uh, he, was, he was raised in a, a very uh, liberal Unitarian household with a very unstructured and uncreedal faith at all. And, and so his parents, uh, just loving, wonderful parents who um, just nurtured him and surrounded him with art and literature and everything, but just encouraged him to explore everything. Well, unfortunately, one of the things he explored was spiritualism, mm -hmm. and he said he had really a, uh, you know, a frightening encounter with evil, with the, just the, the positive form of evil, something demonic. Mm -hmm. He said he believed in God, in the devil, before he believed in God. Mm -hmm. And so he went through a real dark period as, as, um, as a young man, and then that's when he started putting together his, his faith, was like after that experience. So he joined the Anglican Church at the time he got married. His wife was a very devout Anglican, and, uh, uh, and he said she, she was the first Christian he ever met who was happy. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, but, you know, his, his uh, so that was 1901 when he joined the Anglican Church in his marriage, and he converted to Roman Catholicism in 1922. So about two-thirds of the way through his writing career. What's amazing is that there's, you really don't see any difference in his writing between his pre-conversion and post-conversion. There's certain things he wrote for some Catholic newspapers that are on specific Catholic creeds, but for the most part, like, Everlasting Man is written after his conversion, and Orthodoxy is written before his Roman Catholic, and, and they're really telling the same story, exactly. Yes? Um, I'm curious about in his eclipse and then his resurgence and interest in that in, 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 from a particular uh, vantage point, um, and that is uh, Christian, whether they be Catholic or Protestant, Colleges, which, which he seems well, he, he seems to be particularly not peculiarly, but particularly uh, capable of being well received in a, at least conservative Catholic quarters. But what, what uh, tell me if that's not true? But it, what what's happening in, in other in, in Protestant well, colleges? Yeah, I can tell you. I've been I've been invited to speak in a lot of. Uh, Strong evangelical schools that, that they, they like Chester because they like C.S. Lewis, and um, so I've spoken at Biola and uh, Wheaton and Gordon and uh, some others that, uh, that was very well received. They really like Chester in, in, in those settings, um, and I, I, I have spoken in some, you know some secular universities as well where we just talk about Chester from a literary standpoint, and you know I. I mean, that, that's pretty brave even for a, you know, an English department to explore him as a literary critic. He, you know, he's, his literary criticism is just excellent, but, but people are afraid of him because he does talk about religion, and that's just so dangerous and so forbidden, you know, and it's, it's a pity because no one's studying his great literary criticism. But yeah, the, I would say the, you know, the, the stronger traditional uh, uh, Protestant schools you know, are still very welcome in Chesterton. 
Yes. Did he make his living primarily as a writer then? Oh yeah, he, as a journalist. I mean, yeah. his, his bread and butter was, was his, his journalism. His, it wasn't until the, the end of his life when he was really starting to get some good advances for his books. Yeah. And so his, his later books you know, made, made more money. But in orthodoxy, he, he sold it for a hundred pounds and never got another dime. He, he, he made some really bad literary decisions, but he finally got a literary critic, a literary agent who actually still represents his estate. Uh, that, that, that company still represents his estate. His uh, estate is owned by the uh, Royal Literary Fund because he had no descendants. He had one, one or children, but they had none. I'm yes? kind of curious from your experience traveling the country and the world uh, presenting on him, is there some sort of common denominator in, in the different societies that, is there a, a resurgence of interest in him or is it a kind of a level or what, why are people coming back to him or where is the interest coming from? Yeah, no, there, there's, I would say a very wide resurgence uh, and it's really hitting at all, all levels. I mean, there's, there's the older generation that remembers reading him a long time ago that, that they're coming back to him now, there's, there's that. Um, there's that middle generation that just never read him, and they're they have yeah, this certain anger when they discover him. Like, okay, why didn't anyone teach me about Chesterton? <laughs> At all, so they they come into it angry, but still still happy to have discovered him. But it's you know they they have just a totally different attitude towards him. So then you have the young generation that uh, discovering him on you know on their own um, because he's still generally not taught. Um, but in the universities now, you're seeing starting to see students who are doing their research papers on Chesterton, their their senior theses on Chesterton, there's graduate uh, dissertations on Chesterton that just this was not happening ten years ago, and uh, you know more and more dissertations are starting to come on Chesterton. So he's being taken a more seriously now at, at the scholarly level, but all all from the, the grassroots level. There's some universities now that are starting to teach Chesterton courses. In fact, at Notre Dame, now there, every other year there's a course on Chesterton. So things like that are starting to happen. Yeah. Yes? What was uh, prompted his uh, conversion to Roman Catholicism? Uh, he, uh, he talks about his conversion in a couple different places. In fact, he, he wrote a book on conversion, Catholic Church and conversion, and he also talks about it in his autobiography. And um, I'm you know, he would have considered himself an Anglo-Catholic. In fact, he spoke at Anglo-Catholic conferences, um, you know, in the middle of his writing career. But um, the, uh, I think it was a, just a, a long, steady, and deliberate conversion where he uh, uh, found in, in Rome the, the historical church. And uh, he said that, that, that there's three stages to to conversion. The first stage is you, is you decide you're going to be fair to the Roman Catholic Church. And he says there really is no being fair to it. People are either for it or they're against it. They're never neutral about it. And as soon as they start stop being against it, they, they feel themselves being drawn towards it. And he said the second stage is simply discovering the Roman Catholic Church, just learning all the things that, that, that he never knew about it before. And he says it's like visiting a foreign country with these exotic butterflies and flowers that you never knew existed. He said, that's the fun time, because that's the discovery, but there's, there's no commitment. You can leave any time you want. But then comes the third stage, which is running away from the Catholic Church. <laughs> so he says, after his intellectual arguments have been, been answered, it's just a matter of the will and uh, a matter of uh, choosing. And uh, it, it, it ends in humility with bowing your head and entering the church. Um, it's it, it, there wasn't you can't you can't point to any one moment, but uh, but he said afterwards when asked why he became Catholic, he said to get rid of my sins. Was he immediately well received by? I'm sorry. Was he immediately well received by Catholics? Oh yeah, absolutely. He, I mean, he was sort of an instant Catholic celebrity, uh, and, and so he, you know, he was speaking at Catholic conferences alongside the cardinals, and uh, he spoke at a Eucharistic conference in, in Dublin in 1932, and uh, you know, and, and had, a, had an audience with the Pope uh, in I think it was 
Day 29. And uh, in fact, it was and named Knight of St. Gregory by, by Pope Pius XI. So, so yeah, he's well honored by the church, by the Catholic Church. And, uh, and of course, his, his secular reputation took a hit when he became Catholic. So he went from being a writer to being a Catholic writer. <laughs> <laughs> Yes? So how did you first come to Chesterton? Well, I was a big uh, C.S. Lewis fan. And someone saw me reading Mere Christianity and said, do you like C.S. Lewis? I said, I love C.S. Lewis. He said, you ever heard of G.K. Chesterton? I said, I've never heard of G.K. Chesterton. He said, well, if you like C.S. Lewis, you'll love Chesterton. And then he said, in fact, if you read Chesterton, you don't need to read C.S. Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I consider this a blasphemous remark. <laughs> well, I tucked it away there as one of those unforgettable comments. And it, you know, it was just always there. But then, of course, I started seeing Chesterton's name everywhere. As soon as you hear about it, I remember, uh, uh, have you, anybody read uh, Severe Mercy by Sheldon Van Auken? He, he, talks about his own relationship with C.S. Lewis and reprints several letters that, that C.S. Lewis wrote to him. And in one of those letters, uh, which is a book I was reading, uh, Lewis says, read The Everlasting Man. It's the best work of apologetics written in our time. <laughs> so I said, okay, that's the book I'm going to read. And, and uh, I, I picked up The Everlasting Man on my honeymoon. <laughs> <laughs> says, uh, you know, the three of us have gotten along pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've been married to Chesterton as long as I've been married to my wife. And, uh, 34 years in, uh, in May. <coughs> so when, I, when I read The Everlasting Man, which is not the first book that anybody should read from Chesterton, it's a very tough read and, and uh, it's just a great, great book. But I don't think I grasped more than a tenth of it. But I did know I was encountering a complete thinker, someone who just astonished him, his breadth of knowledge and the, and the way he made connections. And I just, it, it was intellectual fireworks that I had never experienced before. And, and I just felt, well, I felt like the, that generation. So, I, okay, how come I got a college degree without ever having been exposed to Chester? I, I felt a little cheap. Mm -hmm. And then I, I just, try to get my hands on as many Chester books as possible. That meant going to used bookstores back in those days and finding them. And all, all these used bookstores guys go, oh yeah, yeah, there's a little following for Chester. And yeah, he's very popular in certain circles. You know, I have a hard time keeping him on the shelf. And, uh, so there were just we few, we happy few in those days. Um, and uh, then uh, I found there were about there's a little group that met in Milwaukee once a year. Uh, and I went to the, I went to him and did a uh, graduate, the kind of master's degree in my dissertation on, on Chesterton and Hamlin. But, um, but I still thought I was the only, way, the only person reading Chesterton. <laughs> but then I found there was a group of other people that, that met once a year, and that became the National Chesterton Conference. And that, that I ended up taking over. We started the American Chesterton Society about, 18, 19 years ago, and I've been doing this full time for, for 14 years. It took over my life completely. <laughs> when I became uh, Catholic, that was also an important career move because I was invited by uh, EWTN to do that, that the show that's on EWTN, and that, that, really, that really helped uh, the revival of Chester. People were exposed to him who didn't know anything about him. Who, the TV, and, you know, um, EWT doesn't have the popular it once had, but certainly it was really one of the only cable channels back in the day. And anybody clicking their channel would, would come upon it one way or the other. And we had a lot of people discover Chesterton you know, during commercials for football games. <laughs> <laughs> Well, great. I will be back at the back uh, to uh, sell you some more books. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you for waiting for a week for my talk. <laughs>